go. Okay, so Artem Music in Teleski is born uh, in 1593, okay? Uh, she is the daughter of uh, Azorio Gintaleski, okay? There's been a lot of questions sometimes, well, why is it all on first-term basis? It's on first-term basis because up until recently, Azorio was sort of seen more important than Artemisia uh, and for the marketing of an artist and two artists that basically have the same name, uh, it's been kind of placed as Artemisia. Uh, Artemisia is the only daughter of the family, there would be three brothers. And along with that, the mother would pass away when she was quite young, uh, when Artemisia was about 11 or 12. Uh, Azorio wasn't really the most uh, successful painter uh, in Rome, but still had a career. Uh, and Azorio had started training Artemisia in the house, because if you're a woman in the 15, 1600s, you really didn't go out of the house. You were basically a prisoner uh, in your own uh, domestic settings up until the point of being married. Uh, this is an early Azorio. Azorio uh, was a mannerist painter. And what we mean by that in regards to mannerism is that you're making paintings that uh, uh, definitely have religious connotations, of course, but you're basically using uh, plaster casts, uh, would be seen as old master drawings to make your painting. So uh, Azorio is making this painting of the Madonna and Child, but there's really no uh, models being incorporated. Uh, it, everything looks very kind of stiff, almost kind of doll-like. Uh, the baby actually has the most sort of liveliness. Uh, the two figures in the background, uh, you know, they kind of just seem really out of proportion. Then Caravaggio comes along uh, in Italy, and it's hard to, well, the paintings are still pretty awesome even to this day, so it's hard to imagine how ab absolutely revolutionary uh, these paintings were. Uh, this is the crucifixion of St. Peter, and I'm putting this one up because we know for sure that uh, Artemisia definitely saw this painting uh, and another Caravaggio for sure. There's a lot of debate about how much she got to see as an individual to sort of be inspired by, especially early on, but this one we know for sure. What's different between, let's say, painting like this and painting like this, first and foremost, is that uh, the use of life models or real individuals is becoming a primal focal point for the making of the art. Now, life models and life drawing was sort of used in early preparations of your artistic training, but after that, it was kind of thrown to the wayside, so to speak. OK, uh, and here we've got this sort of old, you know, it definitely looks like a real old man. Uh, the, the beard feels quite tactile and real. And these figures are in motion. Uh, the other thing that's quite important is you can kind of see the color range, which would be inspiring to all the artists that would follow Caravaggio, which are called the Caravaggioists. So you've got this sort of green this very kind of deep vermilion red and this kind of yellowy brown. The work like this was incredibly popular also to worshipers going to church just because they finally began to see themselves in the artwork, so to speak. You know, if you were poor, you probably didn't have shoes. And, you know, as we can see the figure that's kind of hoisting, uh, uh, St. Peter on the cross, you know, the kind of the kind of raggediness of the feet and the dirtiness of the feet kind of just basically completely encumbered in dirt. Uh, and Azorio definitely uh, drinks the Kool-Aid uh, and basically becomes one of a group of uh, Caravaggioist followers. So this is a portrait of a lute player that Azorio uh, did just a few years after sort of doing this. Uh, and, and would continue to kind of work in this kind of Caravaggio-esque vein for the rest of his life. Uh, 
there's the possibility, and scholars love this, that the model is Artemisia. So we know that Artem from the paintings, Artemisia sort of had kind of mousy golden hair. Uh, it was quite thick, it was quite curly, and people kind of connect uh, to that. We also know that Osario did know Caravaggio, which is quite funny when Caravaggio was being sued uh, for sure, uh, and all the Caravaggios were involved also. Uh, Caravaggio said that he didn't know Osario, but Osario, at sort of being interrogated, said, yes, I knew him, but a very, a very long time ago. Now, uh, during all this time of sort of Osario switching his style, so to speak, uh, Artemisia is basically not unlearning a style to make a new style, but basically taking on the new approach almost as her year zero and kind of developing forward with that, okay? Now, this is the first uh, Artemisia Gentileschi painting that we know of. Uh, she paints this when she, I just wanna get this right, when she's 17. Uh, this is Susanna and the Elders. Uh, the Suzanne and the Elder story is basically these two kind of lecherous guys kind of spot Susanna sort of uh, slightly unclothed bathing. Uh, they're going to, they kind of want to have their way with her and they say, well, if you don't do this and that and everything, we're going to, you know, we're going to tell how horrible you are and how pure you are. So there becomes this kind of trial on, and the two guys, unfortunately, unfortunately, didn't get their stories right and they get in a lot of trouble. That's basically the short version of the story. Uh, now, there's a lot of debate about if, she, and it's kind of annoying of who did what. So people, there's lots of people that say, well, there's no way that she could have done this at 17. You know, uh, definitely uh, Osorio, dad helped out, so to speak, so on and so forth. Um, in my point of view, this kind of paint handling is not here. The, this type of body, this type of flesh uh, of rendering is night and day to this. So uh, I'm in the camp that she probably did the whole thing. Uh, I'm when looking at sort of the kind of awkwardness of the figures at the top, it seems like something that her father might have helped out with. Maybe not. Uh, we don't know. Uh, but besides all that historical stuff, it's quite an intense painting and it's also quite an intense pose for uh, the people uh, who paint out there, so to speak, out in Zoom land. Uh, if and when you see this painting, it almost kind of feels like two different poses. The kind of, from the kind of waist up to the waist down is kind of almost like two different figures. Uh, the body doesn't really move like that. You know, if you're recoiling from someone, fine, but there's no way in my mind from the types of paintings that I've done that both hips can be flat on a kind of, marble tabletop, whatever you want to call it, uh, and bending like that. The, the extension of the face is quite dramatic and the extension of the neck. Uh, all these things I'm pointing out to you, I'm not saying are mistakes. I think they're just incredible things that kind of add uh, to the picture uh, itself, okay? Uh, this is a photograph I took at the exhibition just to try and get a better sense of the types of uh, the flesh handling that was being used. Uh, it's also kind of interesting as you can kind of see this kind of fold in the linen. Uh, and that's because back then and Osorio kind of showed Artemisia how to do this is sort of extending uh, the surface of the painting in order to make it larger. Now, I'm going to stay here okay so this is the part of the narrative which uh gets a little bit uh intense but it's important to be to discuss it and also to discuss other aspects azorio was not a really not really 
famous uh, or as powerful or as big as, say, Caravaggio. He definitely had work. And back in those days, you weren't really painting for yourself. You were basically working in a commission setting in basically a whole set of narrative stories that are related to the Bible, related to Ovid's Metamorphosis, or portraits for uh, society. Okay. Uh, around that time, uh, he decides to start working with this guy named Augustino Tassi. Now, it's quite unclear why in the world Azorio would do something quite like that, because Tassi was uh, a real shit. Let's just put it that way. Uh, he was found guilty of incense, in, in, incense, incest. Uh, he um, almost murdered one of his courtesans who was pregnant. Uh, he uh, h was hated so much, he was almost assassinated, but it didn't work out. But Azorio had decided to hire Tassi to teach Artemisia uh, perspective, uh, as uh, Tassi's paintings were much more perspectival. During one of their encounters or lessons in the house, uh, Tati uh, took uh, Artemisia by force. Uh, and we know this because there's uh, all this information is from court proceedings. We know that uh, Tati had a knife uh, and was quite horrific with it. At the same time, Artemisia fought back and ripped uh, part of his skin off in an undisclosed area. After the event, uh, Tassi had basically said that, oh, don't worry, uh, I'll marry you, so on and so forth. And they continued uh, seeing each other for about a month. After that month, it had become quite clear that Tassi was already married. Now, the rape case uh, was not um, wanted by Artemisia, it was Osorio, because back in that day, if you were quote unquote unpure, how could you be married off? Okay, so it was Osorio who basically wanted to take Tassi to trial, uh, and that was what occurred. Uh, during the trial, back in that those days and times, uh, if you were you were basically innocent until, I'm sorry, guilty until proven innocent as compared to today, most of the time. Uh, and in Italian court, uh, Artemisia and several people that were there to defend Artemisia, uh, you would basically be tortured in order to uh, make sure that you told the truth. Uh, the mode of torture that was given to Artemisia was this kind of hand rope, uh, Finger, finger clenched torture device uh, that was used. And as the fingers, as the ropes got tighter and tighter, uh, Artemisia sort of made really direct comments to Tassi. It was like, is this the ring that you promised me? Uh, the courts uh, decided to uh, believe Artemisia. Uh, Tassi was expelled from Rome. Uh, the day after the trial, which is quite interesting, is the lawyer that was representing uh, the Gintaleski family had a brother in the family named Pierantino Stati Statesi. These guys were in Florence, uh, and it was arranged that um, uh, Pier uh, Pierantino and Artemisia, the day after the trial, would get married, and they did. Uh, and with that, Artemisia moves to Florence. Uh, they're waiting for the money to arrive from the trial, which never really comes. Uh, they are also sort of waiting for money from dad, which some of it comes, but not as much of it does. But basically what now is beginning in Florence is uh, Artemisia is living in the Statisi household. Uh, Pierantino is a painter, but not really a good one. Uh, and the focus on the household is basically on Artemisia's development as an artist as, and as a painter. Um, and that's going to lead us to what, uh, we're gonna do. yeah, we're going to, this is going to lead us to probably the, one of the most important 
uh, and the most widely known group of paintings that Artemisia does, uh, which is the Judith and Holofernes theme. Now, the Judith and Holofernes theme, the story basically is, is that Holofernes is a general and uh, he is there attacking uh, the Israelites. Uh, and Judith basically goes to Holofernes' uh, campsite uh, dressed quite nicely. They have a lovely dinner together. They have some nice wine. Uh, and whilst Holofernes is asleep, uh, Judith basically slices his head off. Uh, wrap, uh, wraps it up with the help of her older uh, maid, and off they go into the sunset. And the um, just give me the name of the tribe, right? Uh, uh, and the Assyrian army, since they've kind of lost Halfrenes, basically it all kind of crumbles apart, and the Israelites kind of survive for another day. What's interesting is that the older depictions is always of a woman holding the head either with a sword or without, sometimes clothed, sometimes the, the female figure is clothed, sometimes it is not. Uh, and this is a quite older version of it. This is another version of it. This is a painting at the National Gallery. Uh, same kind of thing. You have this kind of uh, young woman, uh, you know, she's kind of looking off quite uh, sort of laissez-faire. You've got the kind of older sort of, uh, if you want to call it hag, uh, maid, servant in the background, they're wrapping up this head. Oh, look, I have a sword, but oh, the sword is clean. Everything is clean and everything is nice and fine and dang. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Michelangelo's depiction of the same story, uh, the same so kind of thing. You've got this kind of male figure kind of flailing uh, in the background and the limbs are kind of up in the air, almost like as a praying mantis, so to speak, and they're sort of wrapping up the head and off they go. Then Caravaggio shows up, okay? This painting is his take, and this is 1599, okay? Uh, 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 1599, beheading, uh, yeah, uh, Judith beheading Holofernes, okay? This is where things get a little bit confusing, but let's at least just kind of talk about the painting and also some of the aspects of the effect, okay? So this is Caravaggio is basically doing what he does best is he's kind of creating a dramatic light, which isn't quite real. It's almost, if you want to call it the birth of cinema. And it is, you know, and Judith is basically beheading Paul Fernies, which I just said about five times, I'm sorry. But this to what we know is probably the first and first depiction of the act in, or in a painting by anyone, okay? There's a lot of discussion about this painting where the drama of the Hall Fernies and the maid are quite severe, whilst the uh, Judith, she's kind of just sort of looking quite pensively uh, at the act of what she's doing. Uh, I've seen this painting in person, and to me, the real drama in the Judas figure is the arms. The arms are almost incredibly, you really kind of feel the strength in the arms as they're kind of dicing through uh, uh, Hall Fernese's neck. I also uh, was talking to some of my students this morning, and I do think that if Paul Fernese's face was quite extreme and the maid's face and Judas's face, it would just be way over the top. I think the kind of slight detachment in the face uh, and the emotions in the face kind of make you focus more on the folds of the fabric of her sleeves, the kind of wistfulness of the kind of skirt she's wearing and the real impact of the hand. Now, uh, the blood kind of seems very kind of 80s horror, uh, and I don't mean that in a good or a bad way, but it's just kind of what's uh, going on. Now, it's under this, there's lots of scholars out there that say that uh, Artemisia's response to the theme is impossible without this painting. The problem is, is that this painting is, even though it was painted in 1599, was in a private collection's hands right away. It was in the collection of an Italian lawyer. It wasn't on public display like the crucifixion picture that we saw earlier. So it's quite possible that she quote unquote heard about it. It's quite possible that she saw someone had made a drawing of it, but we really don't know. 
okay? But this is her response to the theme. This is now, this is the, the now the scholars debate, but this is the first one, okay? Because there's two versions, okay? Now, it's interesting about the painting, first and foremost, to me at least, is the bed. Uh, the bed always kind of reminds me of uh, uh, the, the bed in uh, The Godfather with the horse head scene. I mean, it's complete, the, the bed is quite beautiful, but it's also quite disgusting at the same time. Blood is going all over the place. The trickles of the blood almost kind of feel like a snake kind of going and leaving his body. What's really interesting about Artemisia's depiction of it is that she's gotten rid of the old maid and kind of put in uh, a, definitely a younger servant. You definitely get the feeling of the class differentiation between the two women, but that the two women are basically working together to basically hold down this really big soldier because that's basically what he is. Uh, and you really get that sensation of a real kind of interesting fight uh, sort of happening and going on. Now, there's lots of writers, there's lots of scholars that say that what had happened in, in Rome with Tassi is now showing up uh, in, in her artwork to sort of vindicate what had occurred uh, to, uh, you know, to sort of exercise these demons. But we also have to remember that back in those days, you really couldn't quote unquote, pick what you were gonna work on, okay? You were kind of being commissioned to do certain things. It's also important to kind of know that uh, the marriage with, that everything was not going badly in Florence. She was married, uh, you know, as I said to Fiorentino, uh, they tried several times to have children and in the end she gave birth to five times. It's also quite interesting. She's working on these huge paintings on and off while pregnant. Uh, two of the children survive, one a girl uh, who lives quite long, uh, and then the uh, younger brother sort of just dies, I believe, after about two years. Um, that was, up until recently, all that we kind of knew about Artemisia. So as time has gone on, uh, and scholar research has gone further through documents. Uh, up until recently, a few years ago, we found letters from Artemisia to a lover that she had. Let me get the name right. Uh, it's her affair with this guy named uh, Francesco Maria Maringi, who was an administrator and nobleman. Uh, it's a quite a unique relationship because even her husband knows about it. When you go to the National Gallery, um, they have the letters there. Um, there's one quite interesting letter where basically one side of the letter is a letter from Pirantino to uh, Francesco, basically talking about Artemisia's paintings and that she needs more money and can you help out so on and so forth and her paintings are great. Uh, and while the other side is a quite sort of explicit uh, love letter. Um, we get the sensation from the letters that she learned to write quite quickly while she was in Rome and growing up she didn't know how to write. Uh, she was learned to write whilst in Florence with her new family. Uh, she was also quite smart where even though her writing was a little bit odd uh, and lots of spelling mistakes when she was writing to patrons, she would get someone else to uh, write them. Uh, and, and also, you know, was very distinctive in what she wanted in her, in her career. Uh, also, you know, also had a really great sense of humor and sort of made lots of jokes. Uh, one in particular about that uh, Francesco had to stop masturbating in front of her self-portraits and sort of come visit her and, you know, get to it, so to speak. But I'm telling you all these things just to kind of basically show that even though there's definitely a trauma that occurred in her life, just like I'm sure that we've all had traumas in our life, that her life, our life is kind of built of many experiences, some good, some bad, some mundane, some boring, and I think all those types of things really uh, come up and illustrate and make a much more interesting uh, individual. Other now back to just back to painting and things. 
we know for a fact now that this painting was cropped down. So we don't know what it actually looked like, but the left-hand side and the top at some points were crop was much larger. Okay, and that becomes quite evident in the second version. Uh, the second version, uh, which is, I believe this one is now in the Uffizi, uh, this was uh, definitely commissioned uh, actually, and if you can believe it, and would later go to the Uffizi. Uh, so you said, uh, it's also quite funny is that it's been in the Uffizi most of the time. Uh, definitely there's been times where it's been stored uh, in a dark hallway. Uh, there's been times where about 200 years ago, there were discussions that like, can we please burn this thing? This painting kind of takes everything from here a step further. And we also know that it's the second version because uh, Artemisi is doing this interesting thing where basically this painting was transferred, meaning that at some point, uh, and they don't know how or when, but basically art and museum almost made like a really large tracing on an ex on another sheet of paper, almost like you would do in school on tracing paper, uh, had it for a while and used it to basically block in the basic shapes of the painting. Uh, they know that through x-raying the picture and, and it becomes quite clear. The, paint handling of everything is kind of going one step further. Um, and also the violence uh, involved in the painting. Uh, we, here we get her kind of hitting the jugular uh, and blood kind of splurting just about everywhere. And Artemisia is kind of not holding back on showing that. So we've got the blood splattering onto her dress and onto her, her breast. Uh, it's basically just kind of going everywhere. Uh, it's kind of taking everything that, uh, and I don't mean this, and I think that mean this in a good way, the kind of slasher 80s horror flicks of that Caravaggio was doing and really kind of brings it to uh, present day in a really sort of big challenging way. Uh, and these paintings kind of ba basically helped make her career and make her name and uh, give a lot of clout to her. The problem was, was that things were not working out in Florence. Uh, money was a huge, huge issue. Uh, Artemisia and Puritino and the kids basically uh, left Florence quite quickly, went back to Rome. Everything was seized in the Florentine house and sold to uh, settle old debts. Uh, one of the possible debts was a large painting that was commissioned. Uh, she received a large amount of money for a large amount of ultramarine blue, which was quite rare back in those days. Uh, the painting wasn't finished and, you know, they came to collect. Uh, and so she goes back to uh, Rome. Uh, these are the paintings uh, at the National Gallery, just to kind of give you a sense of the scale of really how big and monumental uh, these paintings are. Now, back in Rome, things are going really well. Uh, she is, uh, uh, she becomes uh, one of the first women to be sort of appointed to uh, the Art Academy uh, in Rome. Uh, and this uh, insignia, this, this etching is basically based on a self-portrait that has been lost. Uh, what's also interesting to kind of think about is that you know she's gone back home, but is making really specific decisions about who she wants to be around. Uh, tensions are definitely high with dad. Uh, Tossi is on the scene, uh, didn't really go away for five years. Uh, Tossi uh, had close ties with the church and the Pope. So they said, ah, oh, you know, whatever, come on back to Rome. So Artemisia made the really strong decision that, you, that as Rome was a large metropolitan area to basically start hanging out with foreigners. And that means uh, French artists and German artists. Uh, this is a portrait of Artemisia just to kind of help sort of understand uh, what she looks like and that kind of signature kind of curly locks that she has. 
It's also a really interesting painting to kind of see uh, her tools of the trade. So at the bottom, you see her palette, uh, very kind of traditional uh, Italian color range of colors. She also has this, you know, her, uh, that kind of long piece of wood it's sort of in the hand is sort of used to, when making sort of really exact lines. The instrument in her right hand would hold a piece of chalk uh, for drawing, uh, which is also something that she would use for when she was doing the transferring. The transferring technique would be something that she would use several times in her life. Uh, and we also know that it's definitely a portrait of Artemisia because of this. This is this kind of weird um, medallion. Let me just figure out where it is on the note. There it is, okay. Uh, this is uh, a medallion of the ma mausoleum that Queen Artemisia made in the fourth century uh, to her husband. It's this kind of building with a, a pyramid top and columns, almost like a tiny Colosseum or mausoleum. Uh, these were all the rage of sort of collecting in the 1600s and the kind of double representation of the name Artemisia. Uh, the real medallion has the name Queen Artemisia, you know, etched into the back. And so uh, we know that it's definitely her. Now, while in Rome, uh, it's quite interesting to think about how tastes change. Uh, now, the Caravaggioists are still kind of working and the type of work related to what a Caravaggio painting is, the, the wants of clients are starting to change. And this, this might sound quite funny, but if we look at something like, oh, no, I'm going a bit back. Okay, when I look at this, the light is coming from the left, right? Okay, but at the same time, it's a question of where is it really coming from? Okay, and as I said before, it's, it's not a literal light. Uh, it's a cinematic light. Uh, there's lots of lighting in this painting that don't make sense. It's not a bad thing. It's just creating a specific effect. What was happening now in the art world in Rome was that clients wanted the Caravaggio to put the light source in the painting. Don't ask me why, that's what they wanted. So basically, if you had a nice painting and had the candle in it, says, oh, okay, well, that's where all the light is coming from. And that's really what's happening here. Um, this is the Judith and Halfrenes theme again, uh, but in a much more different way, much more historically, so to speak, you know, the, the, the act has occurred. Uh, the head is being wrapped up by the servant. Uh, and you definitely get the sensation of nighttime. The theme is also really viable and important to uh, Artemisia just, and, and all of those Caravaggio's painting because the, the story takes place in a tent. It's not taking place in a landscape, it's taking place at night. So it's a really, uh, if you're interested in painting drapery or figures, uh, it, it can become a tour de force. This to me is the tour de force painting. I, I, I've seen this in person and as much as I love the other paintings which we were talking about, I do consider this painting to be actually a masterpiece. Uh, um, it's really breathtaking to see. Uh, it's life-size, it's quite tall. Um, and the genius I, I feel in the painting at least is just that the shadow on the face doesn't really make sense, okay? Um, it's an artistic device. It creates a really kind of interesting uh, depiction by almost kind of darkening out a great deal of uh, Judith's face, okay? And we just kind of get this interesting profile uh, and this curly hair. Uh, the, the drapery is incredible. This sort of Eastern, uh, Eastern culture uh, scimitar sword uh, also just looking at the table, the aspects of the armor and the candle, those were kind of things that Caravaggio had painted. Uh, and if you were sort of following that ilk to trying to sort of paint uh, metal or armor at night in the dark, something like that, the reflections is what you kind of did. It's also an interesting painting depicting two very different types of individual, two different types of classes. If you look at the bottom, she's kind of wearing her kind of like Gucci loafers, you know, it's at the bottom of the kind of like golden dress. 
Uh, the servant, you know, definitely needs a pedicure. You can kind of see that too, right below her hand. Uh, and I think it's just great. Uh, she also returns to the Susanna and the Elders theme while in Rome. Uh, same kind of thing. Uh, this time the space is, a, the amount of space in the picture is a little bit more. Uh, this is the only picture that I could find on it online. Uh, this is my picture, but we'll go to that one in a second. Um, whenever I kind of look at these, it, you know, the kind of perverted guys at the top always kind of seem like they're at it even already. Uh, they seem to be much more interested in themselves. Uh, she's kind of opened the picture up. There's the kind of water fountain, got the feeling of her body uh, in the fountain. Uh, the pain handling here is really, really incredible. Um, and at this point in Rome, she's really kind of beginning to sort of be known uh, as a painter of really of flesh. She's also definitely known as a painter of some, you know, really intense uh, scenes, uh, the Judith and Holofernes theme, uh, the Cleopatra themes, uh, and also taking on certain uh, biblical themes. Uh, one in particular is uh, Mary Magdalene in ecstasy. Uh, as compared to usual interpretations, uh, you know, of, of Mary, you know, usually that she's suffering or bleeding, uh, scholars feel that she's sort of having this kind of very lovely divine uh, moment to herself. Uh, the, the, the study of the painting has shown that at some point, the left side of her chest, you know, this kind of white cloth that her left breast was much more prominent. So it was much more of, of a celebration or a depiction of the, of the female figure, even though it would have been covered up in this kind of white cloth at some point, a purple cloth was kind of put down to kind of cover all that up. Uh, when you see it in person, the, the detail on the drapery of the white cloth uh, and the hair, the hair was added on to kind of cover up a little bit more of her shoulder. Uh, it's really uh, a wonderful uh, small picture uh, that had been discovered about 10 years ago. This is a jail in Sierra. Uh, this is a small, a much smaller painting, and it's uh, here. It's a, uh, it's another biblical story that basically. Uh, let me get the names right. Uh, okay, so uh, basically, he's a soldier on the run, and uh, she's like, "Oh, can, you know, come on, hang out. You know, you're safe here." And he kind of goes for a nap, and she kills him with a hammer and a peg through his, uh, his temples. Uh, what's also quite interesting is that in a lot of these paintings, she's quite clear to kind of put her uh, signature to really make sure that uh, these paintings are basically made by her. Um, there are certain scholars that feel like, oh, the painting doesn't make sense formally. Uh, I don't really mind that. Um, and actually, in one of my classes, we just kind of did a kind of similar pose uh, there's no way that her thigh on our left could be that that high up. There's no way. So it's quite interesting that Artemis is kind of taking the artistic device to almost kind of make this golden dress kind of envelope the whole area of the lying down figure uh, and sort of really kind of ind indicates that quite well. The hammer, it's de debated, you know, is it in the right position, so on and so forth, but I think what it, it basically does is that you get the sensation that the hammer is about to come right down and go right, right through that skull. Uh, this is uh, just to get a sense of the scale of them. So, you know, these are kind of medium sized uh, pictures uh, at the National Gallery show. Now, Things in Rome kind of wrap up in a kind of odd way. Uh, so uh, Artemisia, at some point, things with uh, things with her husband kind of dissolve. Uh, he kind of goes his separate way. Uh, Artemisia basically uh, becomes a completely independent uh, woman uh, with 
her daughter, and they basically go to Venice. Now, the weird thing is just that, and this is the problem with uh, history and uh, things being hundreds of years ago, we don't really know much of what was happening in Venice at that time. At the, I mean, we all, lots of people love Venice, but Venice in, I think it was about 16, yeah, she leaves for, uh, for Venice, 1626. Six, uh, in 1626, Venice was basically a ghost town. Uh, it was kind of a little bit slow, draggy. Um, the kind of art boom uh, that Venice was, was definitely was. It was kind of over. Uh, we do know that art and music, you know, always was hanging out with quite interesting people, writers and poets, and definitely was doing that at that time in Venice. Uh, but, and this is really the only painting that we know that uh, she did in Venice. This is, uh, come on, this is uh, uh, Queen Esther and uh, King Ahasuerus. Okay, this, this uh, story had been painted before by lots of painter, painters, uh, Veronese specifically. The narrative to the story basically is, is that uh, the king, is taking the advice of one of his patrons and basically going to exterminate uh, several of the tribes of the Jews. Uh, Esther has been hiding the fact that she's been Jewish to the king for quite a long time and is basically going to the king to basically spare uh, her people and to basically tell her that she's Jewish. She's fainting because she has no, uh, what's the word? She has no appointment. And that's the simplest way to put it. Basically, back in that day, if you went to go see the king and you didn't have an appointment or you didn't want to be seen and you kind of just, quote unquote, barged in, even though you were his wife, you could be killed so, or, and uh, uh, executed. So here she is quite uh, worried about everything that's just been described and faints. What's interesting about the painting, uh, besides this kind of weird kind of pimping attire, uh, which kind of seems really over the top, uh, this kind of interesting kind of creepy face in the, in the chair, I think is, is much more frightening than uh, how the uh, king is depicted. It's just that there are a lot of other things that were in the painting at one time, uh, uh, basically, you probably can't see it, but basically where that boot is kind of coming out on that step used to be a very large dog. Uh, there was a whole bunch of sort of things, items in the background, so to speak. Uh, Artemisia took all those things out and basically made the painting, uh, basically uh, the raw material of, of the drama of what's going on, that Esther's fainting in front of two servants and the king's response. The other interesting thing, which I think is important to, to point out in a lot of these paintings is that tastes have changed. And what I mean by that is just that we know for a fact that this painting has been over, has been over cleaned way too much. Okay, especially in the Esther, uh, uh, the, the depiction of her skin and her flesh. Old trends used to be basically quite possibly because you didn't have electrical lighting and things is that the flesh tones, especially the highlights on uh, older paintings would be almost washed out, so to speak, and cleaned down so that they seemed really sort of bright, but they didn't have a uh, pictorial volume, which might sort of explain some aspects of this as compared to something like this. This definitely, to my knowledge, have probably have never been cleaned at all uh, and something like this, which definitely has, especially if you look at the left-hand side of the painting, that type of flesh to the type of depiction on the right. Okay, uh, things wrap up in Venice quite quickly. Uh, she's in uh, Venice for about three years and moves to Naples. No one really knows why Naples, uh, but one reason why for leading Venice, leaving Venice is uh, the plague. The plague is still quite ripe in, uh, in uh, the 1620s, 1630s, and she decides to get out of there. Naples really kind of leads to a really... If 
for everyone who's ever been to Italy, in parts of Italy, there's a really big difference between Venice and Naples, Rome and Naples. Uh, Naples is in the south. Uh, it's a whole different uh, culture, so to speak. Uh, and it's much more, if I can dare say, intense. Uh, it's also, uh, and somehow Artemisia kind of seems to kind of thrive and survive quite well there. You got to understand that even though she's Italian and kind of moving south, that shouldn't be a problem. It is a problem. Uh, for a certain, uh, not Naples born and bred artists, the the idea of a foreign artist kind of coming into Naples, uh, setting up shop was a big no-no. Uh, we know for a fact that certain artists were chased out of town, uh, some artists were murdered, uh, and other artists were poisoned. Uh, she was not. Uh, it's, uh, we know, as I said, described, you know, bits and bobs of her letters before. Uh, it's a really kind of uh, intense, full of life individual uh, who work quite well in different social circles and probably all those type of people that would possibly be against her were for her. Her name and her career definitely helped her acquire her first really big commission. Uh, this is an enunciation altarpiece. Uh, if you were an Italian painter back then, this is what you wanted. You wanted an altarpiece. Why? Because it was really big. You were going to get a lot of money. You were going to use a lot of paint. Uh, royalty was going to see it. The middle class, the lower class, the upper class were all going to see your painting. This was like the, the best uh, card you could possibly ever have or get. Uh, it's also quite interesting, the, the types of taste uh, is kind of affecting Ar Artemisia's work in interesting ways. The saturation of the background, the kind of darks, seem even darker than ever before. Uh, also, you know, if you can kind of see this piece of paper all the way at the bottom, that's Artemisia's uh, signature. At that time in Italy, there's this kind of, we kind of describe it as being quite strange, but the the way things were being made or worked, specifically paintings, was a communal effort. Okay, and what's happening now is that Artemisia is working with other artists to make large-scale works. This is what was done in Naples. Don't ask me why, but that's what they kind of did, uh, possibly to get paintings done a little bit quicker. Uh, this is uh, what is it? That's uh, a uh, Hang on, I got it. Uh, it's Spasiba uh, in her bath. Uh, David is in the background, kind of watching her, so to speak. Uh, and what's interesting here is just that if we think about all of Artemisia's work, there's never really any depictions of buildings. Uh, and how come all of a sudden it's like because it's being done by another artist? Uh, there's basically artists back then that would do quote unquote architectural paintings. Our, ge our geometric painting, so on and so forth. So uh, the figures are definitely hers uh, and what was begin beginning to be her studio. Uh, when you see the painting, it's a pretty awesome uh, bathing jar, that, that kind of big uh, uh, washing up basin. Uh, and as I said before, you know, a lot of the, you know, the flesh tones seem quite a solid here, the, the figure here is, is quite washed out and I have a feeling that's because it's, it's just been over cleaned really. Uh, this is to show the scale of the painting. Uh, this is the National Gallery again. Uh, yeah. Now, around this time, uh, life kind of takes an interesting turn uh, Osorio, her father, has been in London for a number of years with her brothers. And Charles I hears about Artemisia, either through her work or through her father, so on and so forth. And there's uh, beginnings of correspondences with the royalty in England uh, for Artemisia to come to London. 
this was kind of what Artemisia had always wanted. She wanted royal patrons. She wanted to be a painter of the court, uh, even though she was relying on commissions and sort of moving up in, in rank and things. Uh, she wasn't uh, deemed as a, a, the court painter of, of a specific uh, royal family. Uh, this uh, photograph has the painting from Venice and a quite late Osorio painting. The correspondences between Artemisia in Naples and Charles I go on for years. Uh, uh, Artemisia's older brother who's based in England basically travels through France and Italy to get her twice. Uh, basically goes the first time, uh, the paperwork isn't right uh, for her to go pass through France. So the brother returns uh, alone, uh, goes back again, and this time goes to uh, London with her daughter. Now, the question, this period of time is quite confusing about what's really going on. Azorio is there working and Azorio is quite old and he's been commissioned to paint the queen's house. Uh, this, very, this is a, a ceiling uh, painting, uh, ceiling painting, it's a ceiling mural uh, that was originally in Greenwich and is now in the Marlborough House in London. Uh, there are lots of debates about who did what in this painting, uh, we know for a fact that Artemisia did help Azorio. How much help was being given, who was really in charge of the composition, don't really know. Uh, the figure that is at seven o'clock, if it's a dial, this kind of pointing figure, uh, that definitely has supposedly have been done by Artemisia, might be Artemisia, but the other problem is that this painting has been cleaned rework, overwork so many times in the last hundreds of years that whatever style or approach uh, that these two artists had to this piece has basically been lost. But it's an important to kind of show what was being worked on. What was also being worked on was this. Uh, this is, uh, to get this, uh, the title right, because this is a really important piece. This is self portraits the allegory of painting. Now, scholars are having a field day about dating this thing. Uh, we know for a fact that it goes into the collection of Charles I. So it was uh, bought or given, you know, whilst Artemisia, Artemisia was in England. The problem is, is that we don't really know exactly when, and we also don't really know if it really is a quote unquote self-portrait. At this point in time, Artemisia is in her 40s. Uh, the painting doesn't really look like someone in their 40s. That's what some scholars say. Uh, other scholars definitely say that uh, it's definitely a depiction of her daughter uh, who was already helping out in the studio and was becoming an assistant. Uh, what's really interesting about the painting is that the figure, the, the, it, she is making herself in the picture. Uh, you can kind of see that there's this kind of little, there's this faint rectangle. So it's almost like a rectangle within a rectangle. Uh, the surface is quite scratchy and interesting in a way. And what's happening, and what's happening is that the, the, she's basically making herself, the, the forms are quite strong and secure. And, a, you know, looking at the painting, when you see it in person, the kind of drapery on the sleeve, the tie, uh, the angle of the head is really interesting and quite uh, difficult to kind of render and draw. And uh, yeah, that's that. Uh, what the little medallion is at the bottom that she's kind of wearing, I have uh, no idea what it is. Uh, but this is a self-portrait that we know for sure uh, what was her, this is a self-portrait, this is definitely uh, during the Roman period. And, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest, the, the features seem quite uh, different, which is no, no baddie, so to speak. This is a uh, Corsica and the Sartre. Now, this is a quite interesting one. So at that point, okay, well, first and foremost, yeah, I'm jumping ahead. So 
this this painting stays in England, uh, Artemisia does not. Uh, England is not working out for whatever reason. She decides that she wants to go back to Naples. She's had enough. Uh, and just to kind of get on with her life. Uh, or Rosario stays in England, lives for about another two or three years, and then passes away. And, and she decides that Naples, even though Naples was just supposed to be a short stint, was basically where she was going to stay. So as I said, this is Corsica and the Sartre. Now, this is not a biblical story, but this is quite uh, kind of cool. Uh, at that time, there was an author named Giovanni Battista Giorino, and uh, he wrote this cool novel called Il Pastor Fido, okay? And so the story goes is that Corsica basically meets a Sartre. The Sartre is quite interested in her. And uh, he, she basically, uh, wants a few things from him. Uh, he gives her kind of lavish boots and a really sort of nice outfit. And then when uh, the Sartre basically tries to reach for her, uh, she basically, he yanks on her hair and realizes that it's uh, hair extensions. Um, I think it's the first painting of a weave I've ever seen, which is quite interesting. Uh, and uh, what's also kind of interesting is that the book was so popular that uh, people, people would take the painting, I'm sorry, take the painting, take the book, uh, these stories to church and read them in church instead of reading uh, prayer hymns, uh, just to kind of read the novel and to pass time because who wants to read prayers in church? Uh, this is to uh, give us a sense of scale of, of the, these kind of late uh, genre paintings that were uh, being that were the commission and the types of works that she was doing. Uh, this is the last painting that we know of, of Artemisia. This is, uh, once again, returning to the Suzanne and the Elders theme. Uh, and at this point, as I said, she's basically working with another artist in the studio um, who's her main assistant. Uh, there's a really interesting letter where she kind of talks about the wants of the Naples clientele of it being a kind of collaborative effort where almost in a way that the kind of modes of self-exploration that were happening, uh, working uh, alone were kind of being lost where uh, she writes to this patron, when the conception has been realized and defined with lights and darks, and established by means of planes, the rest is trifle. At the same time, she's quite adamant that she is an important artist where she writes to the same patron, never has anyone found in my pictures any repetition of invention, not even a single hand, okay? Dealing with this painting and thinking about the painting that she made when she was 17, it's, miles away, and it should be. It, the first one is made by uh, a woman, you know, uh, in 17, and now we've got someone nearing uh, the end of her life. The paint handling of the flesh, which has occurred, you know, over the past couple of paintings are really sort of being shown. Uh, but what's really interesting about the painting is even as a painting, you really kind of get a sensation of how really disgusting these two guys are that are kind of like these kind of two lecherous dudes kind of leaning over. They all look a little bit hot and sort of sweating in their cheeks and their chest. They've got these kind of weird sort of cold hands and she's kind of just batting them all uh, aside. Uh, this would be her last work and, uh, and unfortunately she would uh, pass on. Now, the story doesn't end there. I just wanted to put this one in just because I actually really like it. This is a nun painting. But um, after the passing, there's a brief period of time in Rome, specifically female, uh, an, uh, the female noble family are really kind of uh, putting her paintings on display uh, in their own private collections in their houses. And so all these paintings that are you know, that were bought and commissioned, uh, you know, the fact of, of who she was uh, for a, quite a long time becomes very important to uh, Italian women, for sure. Uh, 
now I'm going to move forward uh, several hundred uh, years.